rudiments of trench warfare here uh, at Fort Harrison. We're so very glad to have you all. We have a whole series of these kind of events that go on, folks. Uh, we have World War I now in uh, May, of course. In July, we have a Vietnam reenactment. Korea reenactment, thank you. Uh, and then it goes on and on and on. Uh, to find out what we have going on and, and where it's at and when it's all scheduled, the best thing to do is to go to our website, which is at uh, www.dnr.in.gov. Go to the Fort Harrison site, link over to our special events, and you get a full calendar of each one of the military reenactments that we do. Uh, for those of you who wonder, Noah, just to answer that question right now, we don't delve into the Civil War, the French and Indian War, simply because we never had the Battle of Indianapolis here. Uh, Fort Harrison was a training ground for soldiers from the First World War on up through Desert Storm. So those of you who are Desert Storm vets uh, may have actually transitioned through here at one point in time. We have exhibits about the fort and its history in the Park Visitor Center, which is open till 4 o'clock this afternoon. And then if you want to get some more information about the histories of the soldiers that we had here, the individual soldiers, their uniforms and the weapons, we have the Museum of 20th Century Warfare, which is in Building 711, the great end of these buildings. And those folks are all kind of leave until 5 or 6. Is that? 6. 6, sorry, not very good. All right, the nurse said 6. Uh-huh. Uh, all, right. all right, so without any ado, Fair Schneider, the field is yours. Well, World War I is thought of as ways of troops charging out of trenches into machine gun fires. While it did happen, there's far more to the history. On 9 October 1914, trenches and barbed wire obstacles closed the Western Front. The war of movement ceased. In weeks, the soldiers on both sides learned machine gun and rifle fire made being above ground generally fatal. The German pioneer branch, is what we call engineers, had 70,000 hand grenades and 106,000 rifle grenades on hand based on lessons they learned observing the Japanese siege of Russian Port Arthur in 1905. Though the Germans were better prepared, British and French troops quickly field fabricated hand grenades to even the battle. Throughout 1915, the Army sought to turn the hand grenade into a war winning weapon. In 1916, the hand grenade proved just another dimension of the stalemate. Another solution was needed. One attempt was to increase the armament of the infantry platoon, which is what we're going to quickly show you here. In 1918, the German Army reorganized the infantry platoon for the fourth time since the start of the war. 47 men were organized into a first and second group, each with one light machine gun and one rifle grenade launcher. The third group became what they called Stoss Troopers. We'll get into that in a minute. The Stoss Troopers, and there were nine soldiers in that group, were equipped with hand grenades. They generally wore these, these were generally sandbags tied together. You'd carry about eight or ten grenades in each bag. They had two basic types the infamous stick grenade, or what you know as the potato masher. The German lingo, that's your style hand grenade, stick hand grenade. They also had these little tiny things called eier hand grenade, egg hand grenade. German is very literal. They tell you exactly what it is. You would use the stick grenades until you made contact with the enemy and you couldn't advance very, any further. Then you'd switch to the egg grenade, which you could throw farther. Then you could either throw it into the enemy holding you up or just behind him. And the idea was not so much to kill him or wound him as to get him to move so that you could keep moving forward into the trench. The faster you move through the trenches, the lower your casualties are going to be. Now, the next major support weapon in the squad was the machine gun of air Milok Vimsane, the MG08-0815. This is the lighter weight version of the big MG08, which on the heavy mount with water in it was about 154 pounds. This is a light gun. It only weighed 39 and a half. Now you know why the soldiers are 19 and 20 years old. <laughs> one man could carry and operate the weapon. In this case, it has the 100 round drum on it. However, the troops did not like the drums real well, and they preferred to use the 250 round ammunition boxes. And that was one long belt, 250 rounds. These guns were designed to fire 25 round bursts nearly continuously. As long as you kept ammo in the gun, water in it, and there was no breakdowns, some of these guns during the Great War were known to fire 100,000 rounds. That's why the battlefield was so lethal, because it's not just one gun out there. You've got two in every platoon, times three platoons, times four companies, times five, nine battalions in a regiment, or three battalions in a regiment, 
times two regiment, you can see the numbers get huge quick. Plus your heavy attached guns from the regiment. They were generally used for flank protection during an assault, so they're not firing ahead of the troops, they're shooting to the side to keep the enemy away from the point of breakthrough to let them punch through the line. And in the defense, they really came into their own because they're dug in, in bunkers, they're very hard to knock out. Now, <clears throat> the Germans I also mentioned had a grenade launcher, Come on there. and this fit on the end of the rifle. Oh, there we go. You had two of them in a platoon, or two of them in a, in, yeah, two per platoon. Generally had a range of about 150 meters. And this was to cover the distance between when your mean and and artillery stopped firing to get in. You usually can't use artillery much closer than 100 to 150 meters to your position when you're attacking. Defensively, you can let it come in quickly. So this gave them an additional reach. Lastly, you had your Gewehr Schutz, armed with the Gewehr 98. This was Paul Mauser's masterpiece. One of the things that made this weapon so unique was its system of reloading. Prior to this, they had what they called in-block clips. You could load the clip in, but you'd have to fire all the rounds and reload the rifle. This one, you're loaded. You can imagine how fast that is under fire. It was a huge technical improvement in rifles, one which all the nations in the world copied. Your riflemen generally ended up being everything else. Spare ammunition bearers, replacements for losses, carrying extra water, whatever was needed. Your firepower in your platoon was your light machine gun and your grenades. The American Expeditionary Force. In 1918, the AEF reorganized into 55-man infantry platoons, a hand grenade section of three four-man teams, a grenade launcher section of three three-man teams, a rifle section of two eight-man squads, and the fourth squad had three had four three-man automatic rifle teams. The grenadier you originally used the U.S. Mark I fragmentation grenade, but the twist fuse twist lever fuse proved so inefficient, so dangerous. We ended up dropping them and fighting the rest of the war, generally from July to November with the French F-1. Thank you very much. The U.S. Army also had six grenade launchers. We were using the French Guillain de Villa. My French is terrible. <laughs> no claim to being able to speak French. It was actually basically the same as the German one because the Germans had copied the French one. But it was adapted for the 1903 Springfield. Next, the automatic rifle. Originally, they were issued the Shoshat, which is the correct pronunciation, I'm told, automatic rifle model of 1915, known as the Shosho. The long barrel recoil principle, which is one of Mr. John Brown's design, and the loose bipod limited automatic, limited accurate automatic fire to short bursts only. The magazine's open side, which was so the amber bearer could see when the hand of new magazine to the gunner, allowed dirt to enter the gun, causing two-thirds of your stoppages and the weak lips on the magazines caused a lot of misfeed. 400 rounds fired quickly would cause the weapon to seize and it took as much as 10 minutes to cool down before you could fire again. So you had to keep your rate of fire down as opposed to this weapon which you could just keep firing and firing and firing. But it was an automatic rifle, not a machine gun, and not the same thing. The 16,000 Lebel caliber guns worked relatively well. The weapon used 20 round magazines. Now, the U.S. also bought 19,421 show shows chambered for the U.S. 30-06 cartridge, which is a lot bigger and more powerful than the French Lebel ring. That was referred to the U.S. caliber 30 model of 1918. They had the wrong chamber dimensions, resulting in so many failures of fire, the troops threw them away. Combined with the problems of the M1915, both guns earned a bad reputation. The M1918 only used a 16-round magazine. That was all the space underneath the gun. Now we come to the real piece. Rifle caliber 30 automatic Browning M1918. The light Browning or Browning machine rifle what well, replaced the show shot. General Pershing felt it so superior to German weapons he did not allow it in use until 13 September 1918. Only 4,608 were used in combat. He fired 20-round magazines because that was the same size as the magazine capacity on the show shot. There was no other reason for that. Thank you very much. The 
riflemen. <clears throat> they preferred to use the 30 caliber model of 1903, but there were so few of them around and they could not mass manufacture any more of them. Only about one in four soldiers actually carried them. The other three out of four carried the caliber 30 model of 1917, and which is unusual because that was actually the rifle the British were looking at replacing the infield with, which was actually a copy <laughs> of the Mauser. Gentlemen, take your post. <clears throat> While they're getting into position,